Good morning, everybody. Today, in this hall, as you know, we will be talking more about the area of data monetization. Our talks today will give great insight into this field on how to use data more effectively and cover topics ranging from risk calculations, predictive analytics to collaborative data science, and of course, going more in depth into the science that is the background of everything. I'm very happy to welcome you all to the second day of the conference. I hope you enjoyed the first one as well. And before we begin, just a small reminder that during the breaks, please do visit our sponsors. And also that for any questions, you can always use the link dsc.network forward slash capital Q capital A forward slash Tesla capital T. Now, it is my greatest pleasure to introduce the first keynote speaker of the day. It's going to be present. It's Mario May Huber, who is here to discuss with uh, to discuss with us the challenges that face data science and big data when it comes to technology, and provide solutions not only for the technology but also for the culture and people within an organization. He has been working with big data and vast analytic technologies for several years and is leading a team at A1 Telecom, Austria Group, where he aligns all A1 countries on data strategy. So, without further ado, I would like to give a huge round of applause for our speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I hope um, you had breakfast and I'm not teasing you too much uh, with this first picture. Um, about the keynote. So what's on the agenda, what I want to talk to, with, to you about today is um, I decided to do a bit different talk, not about technology, not about um, data science itself, but what does it mean for us and how can we enable big data in large enterprises? Um, how does it work there? Because um, those kind of things like big data, data science, they're often applied in startups. They don't have to go back and uh, where you can just start on a greenfield. But what does it mean for a large enterprise to apply that. So I was working uh, the last uh, 12 years in the field of um, cloud computing, big data, and advanced analytics. And today I want to talk about what it means for culture in the company, how a company should change from the culture, what it means for the people working in the company, and also a bit strive on technology, what we change there. So um, to give you an overview, who knows A1, Telecom Austria Group, um, quite a large number of people. So we have 19,000 employees. We are operating in seven different markets. We have 4.4 billion revenue and 24 million customers. For those that don't know it, um, WIP here in Serbia is uh, one of uh, the Telecom Austria, A1 Telecom Austria Group companies. So a little bit about myself. I've started working at uh, A1 in this March and um, I'm heading the Big Data Advanced Analytics and AI at Telecom Austria Group. And uh, in my past, I wrote a couple of books and eBooks on cloud computing and big data and um, related fields. Um, talking at different conferences, uh, teaching this topic, uh, big data and machine learning at a couple of universities. And um, how I actually got here was um, I'm also one of the board members of the Vienna Data Science Group and we are collaborating closely with uh, the, uh, the data science community here in Serbia as well. Yeah, and those uh, that want to connect with me during the talk, uh, feel free to, to connect with me on either LinkedIn or Twitter. Okay, so first um, let's go for culture. What does it mean for a large enterprise? How does a large enterprise need to change in terms of culture? As you can imagine, a company with 19,000 people, where you have a lot of legacy systems, uh, a lot of tradition established over the last couple of uh, years or even decades, and now there is um, the digitalization coming up and uh, infecting all of us, and we have to change towards that. What does it mean for the culture of large enterprises, and how can you actually make this happen? First of all, I want to show a bit uh, about history. Um, who knows this guy? Thales of Milet. Yeah, there are a couple of data scientists here, so uh, they know it, and actually my colleagues know him because I told them last year. So this was probably the first data scientist in history, probably because I'm not sure, maybe there was someone else before. But uh, Thales of Milet, he was living in the ancient Greek city of Milet, and he was a mathematician and philosopher. As you could probably imagine, uh, being a mathematician and philosopher in ancient Greek times, it was not so, um, I would say, popular and you couldn't earn that much money because uh, you could only earn money with um, killing other people and going to war. And, um, but he decided to go for a more um, modest approach and um, 
he once said, okay, but how can I now make money? How can I become um, famous or how can I become rich? And he said, I want to use data for it. I want to use mathematics for it. And um, he was starting to predict um, how the weather impacts the olive um, oil revenue and the olive, um, um, how the olive uh, grapes grow. So he was doing this, um, collecting the data for a couple of years, and then he said, okay, this year is the best year to, um, for olive oil, to produce olive oil here. Um, so we'll get quite a huge number of that, and what all people need when they want to do olive oil, they, want, they need uh, the olive oil presses. So he was, uh, with the few money he had, um, by the end of the year, he was um, buying all the olive oil presses, um, and everybody told him, are you crazy? Nobody needs them right now. And then when the time came, and when um, all the olive oils were harvested, or the olive um, grapes were harvested, he was the only one possessing the olive oil presses. So um, he was selling them at exaggerated amounts, and thus becoming the um, most, uh, the richest guy in Millet. Um, the only bad thing about the story is um, he was wasting it on wine within one year. So um, by the end of the day, it was not so good, but um, still, um, he used data and he was, used mathematics to uh, improve his lifestyle for at least a year. He was probably drunk the entire year, but yeah, it doesn't matter. So, um, first of all, I want to raise a question to you. Um, when we come about uh, big data, when we talk about advanced analytics, we are often having technology challenges. And in my, the past couple of years, I saw a lot of challenges uh, with processing large amounts of data. So uh, who in this room is uh, in favor of administering complex distributed systems, like administrating um, Hadoop networking and all those things? Yeah, not so many. Who in this room is rather in uh, favor of writing cool data science programs and bring value to the company you're working for? It's always the same answer, so nobody wants to do the complex thing in behind um, and the complexity in behind. So. Also, before I, what I forgot to mention at the very beginning is before I came to uh, A1, I was working for US companies, Microsoft and Teradata, and we were going uh, on the cloud with all those topics. So when we talk about um, how we process our data, how we store our data, and how we treat our data, um, the first thing which is very important for large enterprises reduce complexity, because if you have high complexity, it's tough to run data science on top of that. So you're just busy the next years in trying to enable the data scientists. The data scientists get frustrated because they can't do anything with the data. And most likely they also have poor data. So um, I'm stating it radically because um, there are still a couple of discussions going on, but uh, cloud is not the future, it's the present. It's here and um, companies now embracing cloud. And we have uh, three levels, uh, like what we have to do when it comes to um, on premise, uh, we have to take care of the data center, the network, the storage, the servers, the virtualization. I'm simply not interested in that. I want to give this away. And when we talk about uh, the next step, this is the one which is already here, which we can already use, and which we are already using in A1 is uh, we are using infrastructure as a service, uh, cloud platforms, um, to enable this and to improve that. So we are only taking care of the operating system, the big data platforms, such as Hadoop, Spark, Kafka, you name it the security, and then we can do the data science on top of that. But still, in the long run, that's not enough. What I want to achieve is uh, agile data science so that data scientists can start to work um, fast, fail fast, experiment fast, and all the things. So um, in the, um, I want to go for big data or data science as a service, that we shouldn't, we shouldn't take care about um, how we work with Hadoop and how we work with Spark and all those kind of technologies. So this problem should also be abstracted. We're not there yet but the, develop, uh, the technology is developing in this direction at the moment, and this is something we can see. And next uh, thing, which is also very important in large enterprises, who is working for a large enterprise here? And who is working for a startup, in contrast? So, um, a bit mixed. Uh, one thing um, all the large enterprises are having is um, MPP systems, enterprise data warehouses, and they are tremendously expensive compared to open source systems. So um, at A1, basically, we are used to um, do most of our data in a data warehouse and then uh, try to do the analytics from there. When you compare it from cost, um, it's, um, this is one, of, uh, one study I was looking at. 
And uh, when it's coming to cost, like cloud storage is the cheapest per raw terabyte deployed, where you have um, a couple of hundreds to 300 euros per raw terabyte deployed. Hadoop um, is a bit more expensive because you need to make sure that the machines are up and running, but still ways cheaper and uh, the enterprise data warehouses, they are uh, about uh, 20 to 80 times the cost um, of open source solutions. So we want to go for the cheaper way and also for the way which scales better because also in terms of scalability, it offers great benefits to us. Um, this is um, how you can work in an 18,000 uh, people company with uh, analytics and to make sure that uh, it's coming from the bottom to the top and vice versa. So I'm working closely with C-Level and um, applying the strategy for advanced analytics for big data and what it means and how it, it will impact our company. So this is uh, the one, two, three years uh, planning approach and horizon where we are saying, okay, we want to go in this direction for over the next three years. And that's um, how basically how we can do it. This uh, C-level is in charge of the business strategy, the organizational development and the financial controlling. And in between, that's uh, where we are uh, with big data, analytics and AI, and we try to like um, satisfy the needs of C-level, which can be quite challenging from time to time, and then work with the local teams in the countries and in the different business units on uh, translating that. So uh, we ha I have a team um, of architects, uh, data, senior data engineers, and data scientists, and we are working closely with each of our operating companies in this aspect. And yeah, that's uh, basically on the lowest level, we have the execution where we want to go into sprints of a couple of weeks. So we want to answer new data science questions, new questions which relate to data within a couple of weeks and um, also work with the technologies we are now starting to work. Basically, when we talk about big data and advanced analytics, we are using a new kind of uh, technologies or they are not so new anymore because um, when I was writing my book about cloud computing, I was uh, already having a chapter there and talking to people at Yahoo about a new fancy tool called Hadoop. So it's um, actually close to 10 years old right now. Um, but we are not going for proprietary databases and services anymore. So we are using almost everything which is fancy. Um, Spark, H2, R, Python, Jupyter, TensorFlow, Kafka, all those kind of things. Um, and this is also some new skills we need to acquire in a company. Yeah, basically um, what it means um, to succeed in data science, we must change the entire, the entire um, culture we are living and um, how we are working with this kind of things. And um, the, the short answer to that is this cannot be accomplished in some months. This rather takes a couple of years. And one of the key pillars of that are people because uh, data science is not something which is done automatically. It's always done by people. And I see so many people in here and also there are a lot of, quite a lot of people in our company. So uh, we need to make sure that we embrace the people which are interested in this technology, that we make them visible in the company, and that we give them the tools they want to use, and that we give them, empower them actually to learn. So if they're interested in learning, that we give them the possibility to learn those new kind of tools, and that new people which are interested also move into this field. So um, another short story, this guy is uh, called Jon Snow. You probably mess him up with uh, a more popular Jon Snow from Game of Thrones, but um, this one is not, um, he's already dead and he didn't come back. And um, Jon Snow was living in the industrialized uh, London and they had a challenge uh, with cholera outbreaks. Nobody could imagine where cholera is coming from and a lot of people were dying and suffering from it. So what John Snow, a doctor, did, um, he was saying, okay, I'll go and survey the people what they do in their daily lives um, to see how the people act and what they're doing probably wrong. And I see if I can make some connection between people which are having cholera. Is there some kind of connection? After interviewing them and building some statistics where the outbreaks were happening, what they were doing, how they were walking, how they were living their daily lives, he found out that... Um, Everyone who has cholera has something in common. They were using the same wells where they get the water from. And then he suggested to close down those wells and go somewhere else. And suddenly the cholera outbreak was going back. So um, he was also using statistics. Um, was it big data? Probably for this time it was. Um, nowadays it's um, like um, probably big data collected very slow. But um, still back at this time it was a, a good indication of what you can do with statistics and with mathematics and 
by making uh, predictions and seeing uh, the results of that. So I often get the question, um, should we all be afraid of AI now? Because um, there's uh, this like Skynet uh, belief, okay, the AI will, is all going to kill us. Um, and um, should we be afraid of it? Uh, basically, the simple answer is no, because AI is just as smart or as, in most cases as stupid as we let it be. And um, the thing is, if you have a training set and you train AI or the algorithm that all your friends jump from the bridge and it's cool, what will the AI consult you to do? Of course, jump off the bridge. So uh, we should not per se be afraid of AI. We should only be afraid of those people programming AI. And um, those are all of us. So we should make sure that we apply some standards to AI. And this also means um, by the end of the day in a company, when we apply something, we always have to make sure that we do what we do with analytics, with AI, that we think about it closely and that we are educated in this topic. Because otherwise, we'll probably have really bad uh, decisions. So if we, have, if we are building decisions on bad data, eventually we will get bad decisions. And this is not what we want to have. Yeah, so when coming to companies, um, how can you set up and how do you work with uh, big data and how does others work together? Basically, um, big data is multidisciplinary. It's, um, there is uh, not this uh, data scientist who can do all of it, uh, who is a good engineer, a good business owner, a good data steward um, who knows what the data is about. This um, most of the time doesn't work, so it's a team effort. And you need to ba build great teams that uh, can eventually deliver data science. So uh, the question is, how would you set up uh, big data in huge enterprises um, like A1? The thing is, um, you have to work closely with the business units, the business units that are understanding what's going on with the data, what's going on in the market, that understand the business um, problem, that can model the business problem and can uh, formulate the right questions out of it. Then it's about data stewardship, which is often in IT. So um, you, the IT owns the IT systems, the IT owns uh, the, the systems where the data is being stored. And we have to make sure that we apply quality to it so that uh, we have data quality applied and that we, that we have data quality in place. Otherwise, uh, we don't want to end up with bad, bad data quality. And then it's about the CDO unit, maybe working with uh, where the data scientists and the data engineers are working with the business units and delivering the new kind of uh, technology. So this is, um, not, this is just uh, one of the blueprints uh, which companies like McKinsey and like are providing, but there is, of course, a lot of um, things which um, can be done in companies and uh, can be adjusted to each company. So I want to show you one thing which um, comes back to people is a colleague of mine at A1 was doing this. Um, when I came to um, A1 and I was having the last interview with the CEO, I was saying, um, I don't just want to use open source tools um, to lower our cost. I also want to give something back to open source solutions. And basically, we are doing quite a uh, couple of things already in there. We're not just using open source to reduce our cost or to become more flexible. We're also contributing back to that. So this is something a colleague of mine was uh, building. It's uh, the Explore dataset. Um, we had the problem that we have a lot of uh, business users and business users are often not good with R, Python, and the like. So we had to make sure that they can come from a proprietary background where you have uh, point-and-click tools and make them uh, capable of using R. So what we were doing is um, Roland, the colleague of mine, was developing a tool. It's called Explore, where you can explore the data set uh, with a visual tool uh, from our studio. And this is also available on GitHub. I'll show you the link afterwards. Our target and our aim was uh, that we increase the size that data analysts can switch to uh, from point and click tools towards R. So here's an overview of um, how this package looks like, how the explore package look li looks like. Basically, you have a nice overview of all the attributes. Um, you can explore the different attributes with the mouse and um, get first insights on the data before you go drill deeper. Then you can explore the relationships um, between the attributes and the target, grow decision trees uh, also with uh, one mouse clicks. And yes, and whoever is interested, that's the link to this uh, tool, to the GitHub page. 
and um, feel free to um, contribute or reuse it. Still, someone wants to make pictures, I'll keep this link a little bit, so Roland will be very happy to have more people downloading it. <laughs> yes, and basically, the idea is that we should all contribute to open source and give back. And uh, by this, I also mean like from the internal aspects. It's not just about um, what we are using from the external, but also what we are doing internally. So we're having seven different markets, and we have smart people in every market. And we need to connect them to each other because uh, we can achieve much more together if we work closer together. And so this is also what we want to change with an open source mindset, that it's not like, okay, you did a code here and I found an error, we can make it better. Um, this should be a, create a feedback and not being seen as an insult. And that's uh, also something we need to do much more internally within our company, to share the code we have and to share the projects we have because then we can become much more effective, much more flexible, and we can learn more together. And this is um, if we start sharing and, and exchanging a lot within our company. Yeah, I also want to show you another product uh, we built, uh, which is uh, about data monetization. In the afternoon, Goran also has a talk about what we did here in Serbia. Sorry for mentioning you. <laughs> and, but I want to show you one product that's um, available in a couple of countries we have. It's um, about movement data analytics, and it's called Mobility Insights. We were doing this product together with a partner of us, with a startup company in Austria called Invenium. And basically what they are providing is uh, analysis of the traffic, how it's behaving, analysis of visitor frequencies to shops, to different shops, and analysis of the visitor flows, how they behave in events. And uh, you can view all of that in dashboards, how it's being done. It's, uh, the data is coming from uh, the locations, from the geolocations on the, of the phone data. So basically, we are just using anonymized data here. We are not using any data which can reflect back to an individual. It's uh, highly agglomerated, so we can't go back, and we have uh, made sure that it's fully GDPR compliant there. And we are using millions of users and seeing the prediction, how they behave, how they um, uh, flow over the streets and where they go to the shops. And uh, what is then done is uh, advanced algorithms are being applied and the visualization movements, uh, the, the movements are being visualized. And this can then be used for decision makers to optimize traffic planning, to optimize where they build their shops, and also to optimize events. So uh, during huge sports events, it's already used by the city of Vienna. When we have huge sports events, um, the city of Vienna adjusts the number of subways going on the, on the, ra on the roads, uh, on the rails, um, based by this algorithm, because they see when the people are moving out and when there are a lot of people queuing up on the subways. Yeah, here's an overview. It's uh, basically um, anonymized for, with virtual IDs, so we don't store the phone numbers or the people. Um, the data is aggregated, so nobody can reflect back to how individuals are doing. And we are not using any social demographic data for it. And um, we are fully GDPR compliant and not storing any raw data on that. So it's also one of the things which is very important for us as A1, that to treat the data we have from our customers confidentially and that we do not um, sell the data in um, any way which is not GDPR compliant. Okay, what are the products, uh, the categories we have here? It's mobility insights uh, that we can uh, optimize how people are moving and the location insights for point of sales so that the supermarket knows how many people are coming to my market at what time and where they are coming from and to see, okay, where should I place my next ads because I uh, have not so many people visiting my supermarket or my shopping center from a specific location. And what they also get, uh, which uh, they like most, is to see um, how their competitors are performing. So um, this is what is most important to them. And it's also about event insights. Here's a sample dashboard, what you see on um, this, like uh, when do you have the peak of the visitors? Um, how long did the visitors stay in average in uh, each shop? When did the visitors arrive? Uh, from where did they arrive? How many customers did they have during the day? And where do visitors come from, basically from which, uh, which um, cities or which neighborhoods? Yes, so um, this is uh, about people. Because people, as I mentioned before, main cornerstone stone of uh, building data science and big data in large enterprises. And I think we built already a couple of interesting projects. Not all of them. I was just taking out two of um, all the projects we have. 
and um, some others will be presented in the afternoon by BIP. And now it's about technology. As I already went into technology a little bit before in all of that, because it's uh, intersecting with each other, I'll go a bit more into detail. Um, as I explained before, I was uh, before joining A1 in March, I was um, working for US companies. I was working five years at Microsoft, where I was in charge of big data and advanced analytics and Teradata. Um, and the thing is, uh, whenever you come to companies uh, which are not US IT companies, they say, okay, Google, Microsoft, Facebook, they are so smart, how can we ever compete with them? Um, first, I was working there, and it's, they are not so smart as you would probably imagine. Um, not about me, maybe. <laughs> um, I know the people there, and they are also just uh, cooking with water. And um, the other thing is I want to show you also those companies fail. Here we have um, one thing when Amazon screwed up, and they screw up um, also quite a couple of times. And um, this is um, a book being sold on Amazon for very cheap $24 million. Who could imagine buying a book for $24 million? Okay, we have to talk afterwards. <laughs> um, anyway, it's not a special book. It's not any book which is unique and um, you can buy it 10,000 times if you have the money. Um, I doubt, maybe Bill Gates does and, uh, or Steve, jo oh, Steve Jobs doesn't live anymore. Um, so um, basically, um, this is a book each college student has to buy at a certain degree um, when they want to succeed in biology. And what happened was um, that uh, it was uh, built for Amazon Marketplace, and there were two providers, Profnut and Bodebook. And what they figured out is uh, this book is tremendously important for college students at a specific time before college at a certain degree, they have to buy this book. So what they did is uh, we said, okay, we want to sell as much as possible with that by applying and uh, algorithms um, that make us uh, perform better than our competitor. And what they did is Profnut said, okay, I'm the challenger. I'm not so well known within the college student community. So I have to make sure that I'm a little bit cheaper than my competitor. Uh, Bought a book, said, okay, everybody, most people will most likely buy the book if I'm just a little bit more expensive than my competitor. And since this book is so important, we have to make sure that we are adjusting the price tag uh, frequently. And Profnut was using the number of, of the competitor with 0.98 and bought a book with 1.1, and this um, escalated quickly. Um, so after two weeks, they were standing at a couple of thousand dollars, and this is when the last people bought the book, and what I heard, it was Harvard students, where the daddy was rich. They bought it for a couple of thousands, so like, hey, dad, um, I have an expensive book, please give me your credit card. Okay, sure. Um, then they started to look uh, what's wrong with the book, and they figured out, um, at the price tag of 24 million that they are um, probably a bit too expensive and then they set it back up, uh, back down. So this is uh, when people didn't look into what technology might can ca uh, cause if you're applying the algorithms wrong and if you don't have a limit on how far you would go with the price tag. And yeah, the funny thing was um, delivery wasn't for free. So if you wanted to buy it for 24 million, you had to find a budget for $6 of delivery. So this is not what you want to have in A1. We do not want to um, do such kind of things, but it's very difficult. All of us are working with technology. We know what it means um, when we are developing those kind of algorithms. So basically, here's a study from IDC, a consulting company, on um, what's necessary to run big data and machine learning at scale. And basically, I already explored it before. There are four main areas. It's about the data center. Um, how the distribution works and stuff like that. Then it's about the big data platforms and I call it the Hadoop ecosystem. I know Hadoop is getting like less important now with Kafka and Spark, but I do count Kafka and Spark as part of the bigger Hadoop ecosystem, even though not being Hadoop the main driver of this anymore. And then it's about data science and then it's about also the domain expertise so that you ask the right questions. It's not just that you can do fancy things with your data, it's also that you um, somehow make a business impact with that. And that's about the domain ex um, expertise. And last but not least, security, governance, and privacy, which is very important. So um, I saw quite a large number of data lakes being built over the last eight years. And often we ended up with the data swamp. Um, this is not what we want to have. We want to have a data lake or data reservoir. 
data swamps occur if you let each unit build their own data lake, because a data lake should um, have all the company assets and all the company data, and not just the company data from one part of the company, from one unit of the company. So you need to make sure that you can combine and that uh, all the data you have. Of course, apply a lot of security with this, but I'm going back to that later on. So what we are doing is we are avoiding this by building it in the cloud and building it on top of um, existing standards because we are getting more flexible, we are getting faster time to market, and we get all the benefits of the cloud development of the economy of scales we have on the cloud. So we don't want to have the first thing. When it comes to um, and how will we change, uh, uh, solve these uh, solutions, basically the legacy systems we still have, they stay on-prem because moving them is getting uh, very complicated and very expensive. So we gradually move all the, the workloads. It's a VPN between the cloud and on-premise so that we make sure that we are on the secure side. We're using just uh, Kerberos for security and the basic governance we're applying Cloudera Navigator. Yes, and uh, when we come to the Hadoop ecosystem, um, we also, like I stated before, we want to go from on-premise to cloud infrastructure as a service. The second one is also already something which we can utilize a lot because cloud infrastructure as a service is very major, mature, and then we go to hard speak data and data science as a service. This is, there are a lot of projects already existing, like Databricks is having an automated Spark service on top of AWS and on Azure, but it's still not at the maturity level that you can go for it full scale. But it will take months to years, but then, then we are there. It's about the roadmap where we're going. So we definitely want to go towards um, having all of this as a service because what we should not do within our company or within large enterprises is um, building the stuff and building the technology from the ground up because we should provide value to the business and we should uh, bring new projects to the business. That's why we always have to make sure that we're moving up the level on that. How we built it, um, we decided to use the Lambda architecture. Who is familiar with Kappa and Lambda architectures? Quite a large number of people, and we had a pretty long internal discussion, should we go for Kappa or for Lambda? Eventually we decided um, that Lambda is the best approach for us because Kappa is, if you would be mean and saying it's just a specialization of Lambda because it's just taking out the speed layer and making available everything in Kafka. And then we figured out it's simply too expensive because um, keeping everything in real time, and if you don't need it in real time and you can't utilize um, object stores which are cheaper, um, it doesn't make much sense. And you need to make sure that um, you can combine batch workloads which are cheaper with um, high efficiency workloads um, which you have to keep in RAM or have to keep in real time. So that's why we decided for Lambda because we have the best of the two worlds together. And we decide use case by use case if we are going to apply real time or batch processing for our data. And we have a couple of layers. We have the acquisition and ingestion layer. That's where our data is coming from. That's uh, the systems which are producing the data. And this goes to the storage layer and we decide like use case by use case. Do we store it in uh, HDFS for instance? Do we store it in an object store? Do we store it in Kafka or in any other form? And we have a huge stack of technology which is available for that. In terms of processing, we are basically using Spark streaming and structured streaming and also looking into Kafka streams, which is um, not at that level yet. We want to have it, um, but um, we're looking into this technology closer over the next uh, months, we'd say. And then it's also about data provisioning so that we make the data available for the business users that they can have some insights. And then it's about data exploration analytics where we have, um, for instance, H2O, Jupyter Hub, um, R and Python, and all those kind of tools available. Yeah, and here is again an overview on Lambda. Yes, and then it's about uh, also data science. What we want to do is we want to become really fast with data science. We are getting towards this, but there are a lot of work still necessary for it when we go towards HL data science so that we can answer business questions fast and that we can go for self-service data science. This is also one of the things we want to strive for. Um, so what we want to avoid is block data scientists from doing their work. We want to enable them on doing their work and doing all the fancy things with the data they want to do. Um, governance, uh, basically, it should be smart. It needs to be there. We need to make sure that uh, the data are, is secure and that nobody sees data which they're not supposed to see. 
but also we have to make sure that we are walking on the path that we are not over, over engineering it and that we are not making a too complex process out of that. So if you need data and you have to wait one or two months for it, it doesn't help you with your business problem. Um, basically how we want to iterate the model we want to apply is first we want to model the business problem and work closely with the business for it. The next phase in that is uh, we want to analyze the data and this is basically all about the data science process. Then we implement, meaning like interpreting the results, uh, what we learned from the data, and also making sure um, that we change to how the business is working, how the processes are working, or at least trigger those kind of things. And then we repeat it. We always question ourselves. So this is, um, we applied, I applied it in the last couple of years in a couple of companies. Traditionally, it takes like the first iteration to take a couple of months. And then uh, the way how you're getting better and better, you're getting down to weeks. Those kind of um, iterations should only take some weeks, like four to six weeks is the ideal thing. Um, but striving for ideality is something uh, which you have to do in the long run over months or years because you can't achieve it in the first stage. Okay, again, a summary um, that we do, that we want to do data science at scale and that we do it with an open source mindset, that we exchange our ideas and that we are always like seeing if someone from uh, one of the countries is saying us, okay, you developed this kind of algorithm. Uh, I found it to be inefficient because of this and that. We don't see it as an insult, but we see it as very productive. And we want to um, have this kind of open source mindset that we exchange all the information. This is also very important for us as a company. Yes, um, how we will really achieve that, that we make sure that governance is in place, uh, that we have data catalogs and that we use the same tools and the same platforms across all our companies and that we steadily exchange the knowledge so that we are working together on an international aspect. Okay, then we come um, to the business, answering the business question. It's very important to have the key stakeholders from the business involved at the very first moment and they are the only people that can answer the right questions and uh, that can actually formulate the, the question they want to have solved. And last but not least, what I wanted to say is uh, we should never forget about one thing. It's uh, governance, security and privacy. And this should be built in by design. Privacy by design, security by design and governance by design. Why? Because it's simply too hard to do it afterwards. So, so many companies uh, are saying, okay, we go for security and for privacy afterwards. They never did it because it was simply too complex. Um, so we need to make sure that governance, that security, and that privacy is always part of it. And we also have, um, we also need to have, we are having something also towards our customers. We should treat the customer data uh, private. We should make sure that the privacy is applied for that. And this is why it's so important. Okay, here's an overview of uh, data governance and um, that we are going for offensive and defensive data governance um, strategies where we're doing proactively things proactively, um, that we are like defending ourselves from potential threats. Um, so we are doing some, a lot of analy analysis what could happen to our data. And basically we are working on three different le levels uh, of the data, it's information management, we make sure that we have data catalogs available so that data scientists can look into what data assets are available in the companies, who is in charge of the data, what's the quality of the data. We also manage the quality of the data that we make sure that we are not making decisions based on bad data so that we don't get bad decisions and that we apply metadata management and data access control and system lifecycle management. Okay, so this that's it from my side and I am say thanks for your time and um, if there are any questions please feel free to ask thank you mario for this enlightening talk and yes indeed they do have some questions <laughs> so the first question is how can people get excluded from these trackings for instance, if you have a secret place, a military base or something else, uh, this data can really reveal its location. So do you have any comments on that? Um, I'm, sure, I'm not sure if I understand the question. Can so uh, can people get excluded from the tracking as you mentioned? Um, of the data yeah. of, um, for instance, of mobility insights? Yes. Um, I have to ask the providers of that. I don't know if, um, but no, normally we ask for the TOC mm -hmm. if it's okay um, and only those people are tracked which are having the TOC done. So it's not like, okay, you're tracked per se. 
But uh, for details, how it's implemented on technology, it's uh, something I have to ask them, yeah. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned here that the issue be privacy by design, security by design. So does an IT firm need data science processes from day one? So when can we say that it is the right time to incorporate such processes in our firm? Um, you mean like, uh, if it's about security, uh, basically you should take care of security and of governance at the very first point. And uh, you should make sure that the processes of security are, um, are thought through at the very first beginning of whatever you do with data. So um, you shouldn't wait until the second or third step. And in a general comment on data science, should an IT firm incorporate data scientists from the, their very inception, let's say? Mm, but, uh, so should, uh, should an IT firm incorporate data scientists from the very beginning? Um, in this kind of, yeah. uh, of course, um, the question is if it should be the program management or if mm -hmm. should, it should be the data scientists yeah. themselves because um, also, um, business know-how should be necessary in that. Uh, so you're using Hadoop. Uh, why not use Bickery from Google? They offer... Um, because we are not using the Google platform per se. So we are having uh, a European cloud provider and that's why we are not using BigQuery. So we are using all the tools on the Hadoop stack. And also, if uh, it's about BigQuery, it's a proprietary tool and we can't get out of it. So we would have to stitch to it um, forever. Mm -hmm. And Hadoop, as it is open source, and the Hadoop stack, as it is open source, we can decide where we are going to execute and where we're going to run our data on. Mm -hmm. Sounds cool. Uh, so how do you divide up responsibilities between IT and your group? <laughs> How was it divided up? Uh, basically by our CEO. <laughs> um, no, but um, the thing is, uh, we are working in a COE approach, meaning um, that we have a center of expertise and we're taking out uh, the people um, working with the kind of things until the entire organization is fit and then we um, bring it back to the business organizations. But um, also looking into how um, we were looking a lot into how American companies are solving those kind of problems. It's um, currently the market trend that you take out those people for data science, for data engineering, and bring them to a CDO unit, which are uh, new units being built in the companies. We'll see where it will end up in a couple of years from now, but um, like the environment of um, how companies are working in digitalization, it's very dynamic and we always have to question ourselves. If it doesn't work, we have to see how we are going to bring it back. But uh, this, this is basically how large companies are currently doing it and it's not something we we uh, created on a green field. It uh, happened from talking to a lot of um, business leaders in different industries and companies. Okay, uh, we have a question here regarding how do you actually get the data? So you pay for it from mobile carriers or is it through apps with consent? We are a carrier ourselves, yeah. so <laughs> we it's don't have to ask other carriers to get the data. <laughs> um, but. Basically, um, it depends on what, what data sources. Uh, we have uh, so, uh, different data sources for different use cases. So it's not that we have one data source. Uh, the, the real problem is I think we have hundreds of data sources. <laughs> so um, that's the real challenge we have. Too much data. Yes, too say. much data and we are drowning into it. <laughs> I think it's an oftentimes mm -hmm. case. So have you made any similar big data analysis on other markets, so not just Austria, but for some other countries in the region, for instance, Croatia and so on? Sure, like um, in each uh, market we have, we have different data science and analytic projects going on. So I don't know any country which is not doing anything with data from our markets. Okay, thank you. And on that, I would like to conclude this, uh, this talk. Uh, once again, uh, thank you for your contribution to the conference and on behalf of the conference, I would like to give you the certificate of appreciation. Oh, nice. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> thank you.